Welcome to our 130 Ministries Online Worship Experience. My name is Kevin and I'm the pastor. Uh, and I'm so glad that you could be joining us for our worship um, this Sunday. There are so many things that we're coming to the uh, table with today as we gather. Uh, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, a lot of worrying. Um, but there's also a lot of joy, a lot of comfort, uh, and a lot of peace that uh, exists within our group. We're, we're kind of a jumble of all sorts of different things, um, especially as we deal with the things that are happening all across, all across our country. Um, and so in order for us to be able to come together as one heart, as one body uh, before the Lord, let's take a few moments to go ahead and prepare our hearts for worship. If you want to use the chat feature just to be able to type out some prayers of preparation, um, uh, maybe some prayers of the things that you're hoping the Lord does uh, as we come and gather around God's word, as we come and sing together, um, as we come together and even pray for our country, for our hearts, uh, for ourselves. Um, let's go ahead and do that. Um, so let's go ahead and, and use this moment to prepare our hearts before the Lord. O Lord, your household, the church, in your steadfast faith and love, that through your grace we may proclaim your truth with boldness, minister your justice with compassion, for the sake of our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Starting this week, uh, we're going to make a change with our service with regards to our Bible reading. So rather than having them on screen, actually, uh, we want you to actually worship with your Bible in hand. For some of you, it's going to be your phone. That's your primary Bible now. Uh, if you have a physical Bible, we'd love for you to go ahead and grab your physical Bible right now. Uh, we'll have the references on screen, but we're not going to actually have the text on screen anymore. Uh, we want you to be able to read from your own Bible. Um, this is for your sake, and we believe that it's good to promote a good possible of worship um, as we actually do our worship. So let's go ahead and prepare for that. Um, you can go ahead and grab your Bible right now. We're going to prepare for our Bible readings. Turn with me to Psalm 16 verses 10 through 17. This is the word of the Lord. I believed even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Let's read this next portion all together. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O oh Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. Turn with me to Exodus 19, verses 2 through 9 together. This is the word of the Lord. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine." 
and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. Let's read this next portion all together. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you, and may also believe you forever. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. This is the word of the Lord. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Let's read this next portion all together. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So now we're going to have a moment of confession. We're going to come before the Lord and confess our sins to him. We want to encourage you guys to use the chat to lament corporately of sins and to take this time for personal confession as well. So let's take a few moments to do both of those things. Now let's recite the confession of sin together. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have not done things we should have, and we have done those things that we should not have. And apart from your grace, there is no goodness in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are repentant according to your promises, declare to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and steady life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And now at this time, I'm going to read over us the declaration of forgiveness. People of God, look up and hear the good news. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desires not the death of a sinner, pardons and forgives us through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is therefore now no condemnation, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us, to remember our sins no more. Let's recite this next portion together. Grant to your faithful people, merciful Lord, pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins, and serve you with a humble mind, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now with the forgiveness of sins available to us through the gospel, let's take this moment to sing before the Lord our God together.
blood in righteousness I did not trust the sweetest frame but holy trust in Jesus name my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood in righteousness that dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly trust in Jesus' name and Christ alone cornerstone weak made strong in the Savior's love in through the storm He is Lord Lord of all When darkness sees to hide his face and I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil my anchor holds within the veil
Now let's take this time to corporately, as a body before the Lord, come before him and pray. Again, I want to encourage you to use the chat for prayers lifted up to the Lord on behalf of our community and for yourself. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Dear Father God, uh, you are mighty, um, you are holy, you are righteous, you are merciful, um, you are gracious, and you are sovereign, Lord. Uh, you are our salvation and you are our hope. Um, so we just thank you uh, for the God that you are. Um, Lord, we just want to thank you so much for this time that you've given us to just come together as a ministry to praise you and to hear your word and to worship you. Um, we thank you for the ability to be able to do this despite not being in a physical church. Um, and we thank you for 
the members of the body that you are working through to um, make this possible and the sacrifices that they are making. And so we just pray that you would encourage them and that you would strengthen them um, in this time, Lord. Um, Father, we are going through some unprecedented and chaotic times. Um, we are fearful, um, we are anxious, but we know that you are sovereign, um, that you are not swayed by these things, um, and that your faithfulness to us has not moved. Um, and so I just pray that, Lord, knowing that you are sovereign over all these things and that you are working through and in these things um, for our good, that we would just be able to um, know that in our hearts as well, Lord, not just in our minds, but to have that truth speak to our hearts, to um, help us to turn to you, uh, to be faithful and trust in your eternal promises, Lord. May we not turn to uh, just temporary solutions to ease our pain or to um, take our minds off of the things that are present before us, but that through the gospel, we would just be able to um, strive to make changes that aim to glorify your name and bring your kingdom closer, Father. Um, uh, may our eyes be set on things above and may our hearts just be able to treasure and cherish the things that you treasure. Um, may we be able to see this situation as you see it. Um, and would you just grant us wisdom and discernment to make choices that um, really just aim to glorify you and please you, Father. Um, Lord, we are entering almost four months of quarantine now, and many of us are just tired and exhausted and drained um, from just being stuck at home and a lot of the bad news that continues to pour in daily. Um, I pray that your word would just bring us hope, um, that it will bring us comfort in these times um, and just uh, a firm foundation for us to just cling on to, Father. Um, Lord, I just pray that we would become a ministry that strives to encourage and pray for one another, that, um, that you would put on each one of our hearts uh, just a desire to um, edify our brothers and sisters, Lord, um, that we would become a ministry that strives to bear one another's burdens and, and to pray for one another as you have called us to do. Um, uh, Lord, um, I just pray that you would continue to just work in us and to continue to uh, just mold us in the, in the way that you have um, willed us to be, Father. Um, we just thank you so much for everything that you've done. Lord, we love you. Um, and I pray these things in your name. Amen. And at this time, we're going to recite the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All right, so last week, we talked about why it's important for us to deal with racism at the heart level first, and it's because racism is a sin. Uh, and just like any other sin, sin grows, racism grows in the dark. Um, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 uh, through 11 says this, For one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. So this is what we need to do with the sin of racism. It needs to be exposed. This is the place we have to start. It has to begin with this recognition that there's this darkness in us that needs to be exposed. Um, and this is uh, a part of what the quarantine has shown me, that in pursuing the Lord and being closer to him, there's so much that gets exposed in my heart. And as hard as it is, I also know that... Um, 
This bitter but sweet work is what the Lord has been doing through pandemic, through the lockdowns, through the quarantine, through the isolation. And I think as hard as it is, it's a beautiful work that the Lord has been doing in me. And I hope that you get a sense that that's what God's doing in you as well. Um, and the Apostle John actually mirrors what Paul says here in 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. Um, John says this, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all all unrighteousness. So for us to be able to admit our sin and confess them before the Lord, this is the beginning of being able to walk in the light. So now that we've laid the foundation, um, we have to ask important questions to build on that. Why is this particular uh, issue important enough for a, to address for the next few weeks? Like why make a series out of racial reconciliation? Uh, for one, um, I'm concerned that too many of us believe that racial justice and racial reconciliation is a political issue, okay? Uh, So for those of you who have been more active regarding this particular issue, um, I'm not seeing a lot of Christian responses to this, but I'm seeing a lot more sort of politically bent ones. Uh, For those of you more on the inactive side of this, um, I think it's because from conversations with you that you believe that this issue is political, that you actually don't want to engage in it or um, have anything to do with it because you're just so uncomfortable with engaging in this. However, because the actual underlying premise is wrong, that racial reconciliation and racial justice is primarily a political issue, Because that's wrong, um, there's actually a huge gaping hole in our ability to understand this issue and how we actually start to move forward unless we have a biblical understanding of how we're supposed to do this, okay? Uh, Racial justice and reconciliation is actually not a political issue, okay? I want to make it pretty clear that it's actually a gospel issue. In fact, reconciliation is at the heart of the very gospel. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 18 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So here's the thing. Racial reconciliation is a gospel issue because reconciliation is our story. Our story is one of redemption and reconciliation to God. We've sinned against him and rebelled against him, but rather than forsaking us, God chooses to send Jesus Christ to us. And through Christ's life, death, and resurrection, when we put our faith in him, we're given a new eternal life and fellowship and relationship with God. And now we proclaim that message to others. That's what it means to be a Christian. But here's the thing. This message of reconciliation to God is incomplete if we're not willing to love and reconcile with our neighbors, okay? Uh, again, the Apostle John has much to say about this. He says in 1 John chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness, and walks in the darkness, and does not know where he is going, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And so you're thinking, okay, fine, Pastor Kevin. I get that it's a gospel issue and that we should care, but how, right? How do I care and what do we do? And this is a great question, and this is why I think so many of us are, um, who are active about this issue are so inclined towards the political side, because again, there seems to be so many things that we can do. Um, But here's the thing, I think deeply, uh, from fundamentally from a biblical level, there is something that Jesus says about this issue from the parable of the Great Samaritan. So I want you guys to grab your Bibles, because that's where we're going to be spending the bulk of the rest of our time. So we're going to turn to Luke chapter 10, and we're going to be in verses 25 through 37. Let me read the first couple of verses for us. Verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. 
So here's the scene. A lawyer wants to put Jesus to the test and asks a pretty generic question about how he can have eternal life. Jesus, as he always does, throws the question back at him, and the lawyer answers by quoting from Deuteronomy, as any other good Jewish person would have. Uh, In other words, the lawyer knows his theology. Uh, His understanding of the law is fine, and Jesus actually acknowledges this. Uh, He tells this lawyer, since you know this, you should go out and live this, and you'll be fine. But Jesus knows that this lawyer is not particularly sincere, and the next verse shows us what Jesus already knows. Uh, Look at verse 29. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? See, the lawyer wants to justify himself not loving people by excluding them from the definition of neighbor. So he asks Jesus who his neighbor is. And in this story, Jesus makes the clear point that loving our neighbors is not about trying to figure out who our neighbors are, but being a loving, compassionate, caring person to all people, regardless of social status or race. In other words, the lawyer is hoping that in asking this question, Jesus will show him which people deserve to be treated as a neighbor and which ones don't. But that's not what Jesus is interested in. And this is something that we have to realize is a huge temptation for us because we're constantly um, trying to convince ourselves and justify ourselves that there's certain types of people that we don't have to love. There are certain types of people that we don't have to be kind to. There's certain types of people that don't deserve God's grace. And so this is an issue really, not just with regards to racial reconciliation, but this is an issue with regards to us in terms of how we understand how we are to love others. Um, So let's see what Jesus says about this in verse 30. Jesus replied, A man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. So the story is set up so that we have three people to start with. A man is journeying from Jerusalem to Jericho, and this is a road that is notorious for being dangerous. And so predictably, he's beaten and robbed, and so we have two people coming down this road that could potentially be a hero and a helper for this man, a priest and a Levite. Both of these are in the elite Jewish class, and these are people who undeniably know the law of God. They know that they should love the Lord with all their heart, soul, strength, and mind. They also know that they should love their neighbors as themselves. But what happens, right? Is this knowledge enough? So what happens is they see a man who's been obviously beaten and robbed. And yet what they do is they cross to the other side of the road. I mean, it's a dangerous road. Uh, It's hard enough for them as it is to be on this particular road. And you have to wonder what they were thinking as they saw this person who was beaten up and robbed. You know, maybe they thought that he had done something dumb to get beaten up, right? He deserved to get beaten up because he looked at somebody wrong. Uh, Or maybe he was wearing the wrong clothes or maybe he was being too flashy. In other words, what we do is we take someone who's been a victim and what we do is we justify them being a victim by saying they must have done something wrong. And that's what the priest and the Levite do. They justify in themselves a reason why they shouldn't help this person and they go ahead and they cross this road. And by the way, I'm able to say that because they see this man. They see that he is bloody and beaten and needs help. And yet what they end up doing is crossing to the other side of the road. And the only way they could do that after seeing him is justifying in their hearts that they don't need to help him. And one of the ways they do that is by not making him simply uh, a victim, but making him more than that. Making him somehow um, deserving of the crime that was done to him. And and this is part of the issue, right? Uh, Oftentimes when we think about this particular issue of racial reconciliation, racism, um, racial justice, we have a tendency to pick sides kind of based on what we think people deserve and don't deserve. Um, And this is an issue, right? Um, So we want to think about this deeper. And so let's move on to see what else Jesus says in verse 33. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. And so now a fourth character is introduced. And unlike the priest and the Levite, he sees the man 
but has compassion. He sympathizes with the beaten man. He's different from the priest and the Levite in two ways. Number one, first, he is a Samaritan. And this is significant because the Samaritans come from a legacy of hatred. Okay? Uh, the history of the Samaritans goes all the way back to a king uh, named Rehoboam. He was actually Solomon's son. Okay, so you have King David, you have King Solomon, and then you have King Rehoboam. So he's, he's Solomon's son, he's David's grandson. And Rehoboam is famous for foolishly ending up dividing the kingdom of Israel into two halves. Okay, um, The northern kingdom was called Israel, and the southern kingdom was called Judah. And in 722 BC, the Assyrian kingdom, uh, this is where the city of Nineveh was, as we were talking about in the, in the series in the book of Jonah. Um, they came, the Assyrians came and overtook the northern kingdom uh, and exiled and scattered those Israelites kind of all over. And so this caused the northern kingdom Israelites to eventually intermarry with the Assyrians. And so these half Israelite, half Assyrian people became known as the Samaritans. The southern kingdom was Judah, and it was also captured uh, and overtaken by eventually the Babylonian Empire. But eventually, they were allowed to return back to their land. So the exiled Judeans were allowed to come back to their land. And when they came back, they actually didn't allow the Samaritans to help rebuild the city and the temple with them. So the Samaritans ended up creating their own temple in a place called Mount Gerizim instead of Jerusalem. So for a few hundred years now, at this point, when Jesus comes into play, uh, the hatred between the Israelites and the Samaritans have grown very, very, very deep roots. So we're talking about hundreds of years of racism at this point between the Samaritans and the Israelites or the Jewish people. And so the fact that in this story, the Samaritan is a good guy, that's meant to be shocking, okay? Um, but let's look at how the Samaritan behaves once he sees the beaten man and has sympathy and compassion on him. Uh, verses 34 and 35. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. See, this is extravagant. Uh, the Samaritan steps up in a huge way for this stranger, right? Um, it really is extraordinary. The assumption is that the man who was beaten was Jewish. And so a Samaritan having this kind of charity and love for a stranger is actually remarkable and incredible. And by the way, this, this, this love and this mercy, it's open-ended. Not only was a Samaritan giving of his uh, incredible resources to save this man's life, at the end of the story, the Samaritan is willing to trust the innkeeper with an open tab. Right? That's overly generous, uh, almost foolishly generous, you could say. And so Jesus ends this parable with this story. Which of these three, look at, let's look at verse 36. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? Then he said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. See, Jesus makes it pretty clear that being a good neighbor is costly. Jesus defines a good neighbor as the one who doesn't cross the street, as one who actually embodies three S's, okay? The three S's of the Samaritan. That's an that's a easy way to understand this, okay? So the Samaritan embodied three of these S's, okay? The first one was sees, the second one is sympathizes, and the third one is steps up. Well, what about the priest and the Levite? See, they see too, but that's pretty much it. That's the extent. And that's where a lot of us are in our culture. So much of what we do is about seeing. We have visuals everywhere, and our attention span and our ability to focus is total garbage because of everything that we see, right? So little of our seeing actually leads us to anything. Uh, our souls are dulled and made mute and dumb and deaf because we see all the time, but we never sympathize or actually step up. And that's not okay. We have to move from seeing to sympathy and from sympathy to stepping up. And so one of the things I want you guys to know and understand is, look, six months from now, um, yes, this is totally going to be an issue, but it's not going to be an issue that the world is fired up about, 
right? We're, we're living in a very unique period of time where all eyes are focused on this particular issue of racial, racial reconciliation and racial justice. But deep down, we know it's not going to be this way all the time. There's going to be other things that we move on to because that's how the, the news cycle works. But as Christians, we have to be committed to seeing what God wants us to see, not just simply seeing what the news media wants us to see or not just seeing the most viral videos. We need to be able to focus and see things with God's eyes, okay? Okay. And so you might say, okay, the three S's sound great, but racial reconciliation is complicated. It's not just simply you see something, you have sympathy for it, and then you step up. And here's the thing. This story is complicated too, okay? You're right in that all of this is complicated. What if you're somebody that lives in Jerusalem and you've heard that the road from Jerusalem to Jericho is really dangerous, okay? And people get beat up all the time. I mean, that's what the road was known for. It was known for being treacherous. What does it mean to be a good neighbor? Does it mean that you're always on the lookout for robbers? Uh, does it mean that you have to march out against the Romans to provide better safety for the travelers to Jericho? Uh, clearly, the system is broken if people are being robbed and beaten all the time. So shouldn't we go out and fix that? And yet, Jesus doesn't seem to address that. And that's because he's not looking to provide in this short story a comprehensive plan to act for every single kind of injustice. But he's providing a template for how we step up because stepping up is costly, okay? So with regards to ra racial reconciliation, um, a few application points for us to consider. Number one, do you actually see the problem? Does the problem cause you to lament, right? Are you doing more to make this an issue that your heart constantly is actually seeing? Are you reading about this issue? Are you watching things about this issue? Or are you just ignoring it because it's uncomfortable? Because seeing, again, is the first part of racial reconciliation. Um, we can't turn our head from the hard stuff. We, we should be watching the documentaries and movies and reading the articles that are on our website. Again, we've created a whole section on the website simply dedicated to justice issues. So we want to let our eyes be open to seeing how this is a gospel issue. That's going to be first and foremost, right? Second, are you sympathizing? Okay. Is your heart stirred by the suffering of our black and brown brothers and sisters across this nation? Just in the last 24 hours, right? Just in the last 24 hours, um, a black man was discovered hanging from a tree in Palmdale, right? Robert Fuller. Authorities are saying that it was suicide, but I mean, good Lord, what a painful image for black Americans to be seeing right now in this particular moment. Or there was another uh, police shooting in Atlanta in front of a Wendy's, right? Uh, there's video of another black man shot by the police. Again, in this particular cultural moment, how painful is it for our black American brothers to be seeing this? Um, and regardless of whether or not you thought this footage was justified given the struggle and the danger of that particular situation, can we at least sympathize that this is adding to the trauma of seeing again and again that in the last few weeks, there are black men who are dying and, and black men and women who are dying, right? So this is an issue that's not something that we can just turn our eyes from. If we are truly concerned and we are seeing this rightly, then the next thing that should be happening is that our sympathies should be going down. We should be lamenting. We should be grieving this. This should be breaking our hearts. And it's crucial that as Christians, if it's not, we need to do some investigating. We need to do some soul searching. We need to do some work to figure out why this doesn't seem to matter to us. What is it about the coldness of our heart that causes us not to see this for what it is? Um, a couple years ago, there was a situation with some um, natural disasters um, that had occurred, and I, I made a big deal out of it with our youth ministry. I remember talking about it and making a big deal and saying this is something that we need to pray for and saying that this is something that we need to be concerned about, uh, something that we should probably be don donating money to uh, so that, again, this can be a cause that um, uh, the people in this particular uh, region affected by this could have some relief. And, and I remember um, one of our students just being so ticked off that I would make an entire Sunday about this particular issue when there are so many other issues in the world that we don't talk about on a regular basis. 
Um, and I remember asking this person, like, why does this particular issue uh, make you so angry when there are so many, you're right, there are so many other things that we can talk about. And yet, I've never really heard you talk about any of those things. Like, why all of a sudden does all of that kind of stuff matter? Um, and it turns out that this student was just, he was just mad because um, he felt like I was just picking and choosing the things that I cared about uh, to make everyone else care about those things. Um, and again, I totally understand that. And, and maybe some of you guys feel that way about this too. Like, Pastor Kevin, why this particular issue? Why now when this isn't something that you've really talked about in the past? Um, but again, I want you guys to see now and understand that like those are great arguments you can bring up if you don't want to care about this particular thing that I'm talking about now. And I think it's hard. I think it's hard to be faced with that. But that's what repentance is. I've, like I said, I've had to repent of this because I have been called to this previously. And the reason I was called to this previously was because there was something in my heart. Now, I, I want to be brokenhearted about every single issue. And I think as Christians, um, this, is, this is something that we are called to. I think this is why Jesus is called a man of sorrows because Jesus understood that sin uh, and evil has, has completely broken this world. But at the same time, we can grieve with hope. We can lament with hope, right? We don't have to feel hopeless about the situation. We don't have to feel like there's nothing we can do about this particular situation. That's why I think it's dangerous to make this a political thing. Because again, politics is driven by human beings who are sinful. And for us to believe that somehow um, politics is the only way we're going to get out of this or, or the only way that we can make any sort of progress on this, again, I don't think that's true. I think politics is a part of it, but I don't think it's ultimately it's the only thing that we can do. And, and you'll see in just a moment what I'm talking about. Um, but either way, again, if we can't get ourselves to sympathize with regards to the pain and the suffering of the black uh, American community. Lastly, though, if you are in a place where you are, um, you find yourself seeing, you find yourself sympathizing, uh, we have to step up. And this is where I think there's been a lot of confusion in terms of like, what do we do to step up? How do we do this? So uh, if you're there with me, then this is something that we need to do as a church, as a ministry. But I want to be careful because stepping up is totally situational and depends on who you are and where you are. What do I mean by that? So here's the thing. Not everyone can do everything for an issue. The truth is we all have limits. For some of us, it makes sense to go out and join a protest and march. And I want to encourage that if this is something you can do, that you should go out and you do that because it does make an impact. It does make a difference. But I can't tell everyone to do that because it is situational. Everyone's situation's a little different, right? Especially now. There is a pandemic going on still. Coronavirus cases are up. And some of you guys, for example, live with your grandparents. And so it probably doesn't make sense for you to go and be a part of something that could potentially expose you to coronavirus and uh, potentially uh, endanger the people that you live with. Okay, so everyone's situation is different. So you got to hear me. I'm not saying that you must do these things. However, stepping up is costly, right? If you believe that, for example, systemic racism is, is rooted in bad institutions, as voters, we have the power to do something about it. Uh, we can write to our elected officials, we can vote, we can do all of these things. And I've noticed, and this is so good, that there's been a movement to make writing to our legislators as easy as possible. But I think for every uh, post that says like, oh, just click this link and just sign your name and it'll go to the legislators, like it's so easy to do that. Um, those things are also incredibly easy to ignore. Uh, legislators will absolutely admit that like sending hundreds of thousands of canned letters, uh, they read those things once and then all of the other thousand that come after that. The volume matters, but ultimately in the end, if they get different letters from people, that makes far more of a difference because they have to sit and they have to actually read those things. So I think um, in a lot of ways, it's good that we have easy ways to deal with this, but I also think that it makes far more of an impact for us to actually sit down and write an actual letter. You know, let's take it actually further. Let's have it cost something for us. Uh, why not sit down for an hour and put on paper why this is an important issue for you, a voter, right? Or maybe you're not a voter. Dude, you have to register to vote. This is how we make a difference. Legislation in this country is how we move the needle in terms of moving away from systemic racism. Um, 
if you have black American friends, right? Are you reaching out to them and asking them how they're doing during this time? And I don't mean pandering to them, but I mean on a personal note, asking them how you can pray for them. Right? that you recognize that this is a really difficult time, that there's a lot of traumatic things that are happening and that you're available to have conversations with them if they want to have conversations with you. But more importantly, that you're thinking about them. I think it's really crucial that we do that. There are so many things that we can do to move towards caring and loving people during this time. Or, and I'm being serious about this, maybe your capacity is such that you can't do any of the things that I'm talking about. You don't actually really have any black American friends, unfortunately. Um, or uh, you're just too busy. There are things in your life that you have to take care of that are more immediate to you than the cause of racial justice and racial reconciliation. Um, and I'm going to say this right now. Some of you aren't called to do more than to be really good at your job and to be super generous and to be a super generous person at work because your job has to do with helping people or something like that. And that's okay. Not everything can be about every, not everything can be about everything all the time. Sometimes the greatest things that we can do is simply to be faithful to God in the work that he has given to us. However, you have to be paying attention to how the Holy Spirit is directing your work and your heart and your attitude, right? Because stepping up is costly, and that's the point. Our ability to do anything to help others first comes from the fact that we ourselves have been helped. So our story is that there is a treacherous road called life. And temptation and desire in the world have beaten us up and left us for dead in our sins against each other, ourselves and God himself. But God has sent Jesus, the true and good Samaritan, who sees us and sympathizes with us to give us extraordinary love and grace. And in order to heal us from sin and rebellion, he would give his entire life up for us. He would take the necessary steps to revive us back to life, going all the way to give his life on the cross on Calvary, and then resurrecting to life to overcome sin and death. And this particular story is what should motivate us to act. It's what, motivate us should, it's what should motivate us to step up. It's what should cause us to be out there, to do the things that we can to help those who need it. So yes, it's important that we get involved in the politics of this, right? That's undeniable. Systemic racism, again, it starts at the personal level and it extends all the way up to every single part of our social structures. And so it's important that we do all of those things. But it's also important that we recognize that it has to be driven by the gospel, right? If we're more interested in talking about racism and talking about solutions to racism, then we are talking about the gospel and Jesus himself. Again, our priorities are a little screwed up, right? We have leaned too far to the side of pragmatics. We have leaned too far on the side that this life and this kingdom is the only one that matters. We have to be careful about that. We have to help people see that there's a hope beyond this. Because I don't know if this particular issue can be solved within our lifetime, as sad as that may sound. But I do know that this lifetime eventually ends. And what matters more than this particular lifetime is the lifetime that is to come. Now, that doesn't mean that we ignore this lifetime, right? We do everything that we can in this lifetime to make it mirror the life that is to come, right? We want to be uh, agents of the kingdom of heaven here on this earth. But ultimately, that means that we have to have a firm understanding of the actual gospel and the gospel story itself. And so I want us, 130 members, to be promoting the gospel on social media. I want us, uh, members of 130 ministry, to be evangelizing to our friends, to our neighbors, and to our families through this particular issue because it is a gospel issue. Again, God cares more about this issue than we do. Jesus cares more about this issue than we do. The Holy Spirit is doing something in our country to make this an issue for those of us who have never cared about this issue previously. And I know as complicated as it is, I know that there's, there's been three big steps that the Lord has given to us to help us to understand how we move forward one step at a time. And again, the three S's, really simple. You see, you sympathize, and you step up. 
And, and there's so many, again, opportunities that we have. There's going to be uh, suggestions that we have on the justice site with regards to links in terms of how you can uh, write to your politicians, um, the organizations that you can donate to. I think a lot of those lists that you guys have been seeing with regards to who you can donate to, uh, some of those lists contain um, organizations that are, in fact, very anti-Christian. I want you guys to be aware of that, that there are organizations that you can give to that are, again, uh, pro-anti-racism, but are also uh, anti-Christianity because, again, there are things that we stand for that the world doesn't like. Christianity may stand for anti-racism, but at the same time, a lot of people say that Christianity is also anti-homosexual. And so because of that reason, there are conflicts with the world that are around us. So we want to make sure, again, if we're going to be sending our money to organizations, that we send them to explicitly Christian organizations that are about promoting the gospel and anti-racism at the same time. And so we have a bunch of links to that on our website as well. So I want you guys to be, again, more aware, uh, more explicitly Christian about the way that we talk about this particular issue. It can't all be couched in politics. It has to be beyond that. It has to be more than that. Because again, I our witness during this time is really, really, really crucial. And I know that there aren't enough churches, there aren't enough Christians that are really serious about this particular issue. And it seems like even for us, again, for those of you who are super active, all of this may sound like it's too little and too late. But remember, when we're united with this particular issue together, when we're able to move together as a ministry, we're going to be stronger for it in the long run. Because again, we don't want to be devoted to this as long as it's in the, the news cycle. We want to be devoted to this for our lifetime because this is a gospel issue. So let's spend a few moments reflecting and praying and asking God, God, how can I be involved? How can I see the restoration of your people in reconciliation, racial reconciliation here and now? And also be thinking about, again, how the gospel plays into all of these different aspects. So let's take a few moments to reflect and pray and sing together. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never filled me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your is my confidence you never failed me yet and I know the night won't last your word will come to Praise again Jesus, you're still enough Keep me within your love My heart will sing your praise again still stands great is your faithfulness your faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you've never failed your promise still stands great is your faithfulness your faithfulness Still in your hands, this is my confidence. You never failed me yet. Yeah. 
I want to remind us that the offering is an essential part of our worship, and so uh, we want to make sure that we're preparing for that each and every single week. Uh, the good news is we now have an online option as well, so if you want to go to our website, you can find information on how to sign up for that and how to give uh, to the Lord via online offering. Um, but you can also prepare uh, it as you always have by preparing a check and going ahead and putting it in the mail or uh, dropping it off at the church. So at this time, let's close with the doxology and the Lord's Prayer. Praise God on the blessings of kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, well, that's it for us. Um, but before you go, just a few more announcements. Um, first off, just a reminder that we have morning prayers on Tuesdays and on Thursdays, and we got to remember that praying is not an inactive option, but prayer is absolutely a way that we step up and get involved in the issues that are most important to us by bringing them before the Lord. Uh, I want to remind you that Wednesdays we have our Bible study. Uh, you can continue to sign up for that as we go through uh, sort of chapter by chapter of, a, of an ebook that I've written about how we study the Bible together. Uh, and then again, just as a reminder, we have men's and women's accountability groups that are available for you guys. Uh, the women's group actually starts up on Monday, this coming Monday, that's tomorrow, and uh, they have a book reading component, so you're going to want to sign up for that and grab the book as soon as you can. And then the men's group meets every single Friday uh, at 8 a.m. So please, just a reminder for that, and again, we have the announcements again for you guys. Hey guys, uh, just as Pastor Kevin mentioned this past Sunday, uh, we are starting our men's accountability group. Uh, we actually started this past week, but we still love for you guys to come and join if you can. Um, what this group entails is essentially just the guys coming together 
and just doing life together, um, sharing each other's burdens, praying for one another and just encouraging one another. Um, I think when you're on your own, it's easy to lose motivation, um, just kind of be lazy. So when you have like an outside factor apart from yourself, hold you accountable to something. Um, I personally think it helps immensely. Um, so with that in mind, we're looking to set two goals for ourselves. One being career or academically oriented and one uh, focusing on spiritual growth. And the plan for these goals is to um, each week check up on each other um, and see what kind of practical steps we're taking to achieve these goals. And just really encouraging one another to um, keep pursuing these goals. Um, on top of that, we'll be going through a devos called Come to the Waters by James Boyce. Um, we'll be holding each other accountable to going through that every day. And then on the day we do meet, uh, we'll just go through that day's devos together and share our thoughts on it and um, just uh, share prayer requests that's uh, been on our hearts um, throughout the past week and uh, just really spend time praying for one another. Um, that's about it for the format. Um, one thing that I think we want to ask for those of you looking to join is uh, just to be committed, um, to be 100% in um, and not be uh, shaky um, so yeah um, with all that being said we are going to be meeting Friday mornings from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. and the zoom link will be sent via text message from Pastor Kevin I believe um, yeah so hope to see you guys there Friday morning men's accountability 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. don't forget it Hi guys, it's Leslie, Esther, and Grace. We're so excited to announce the beginning of our women's accountability group. Um, for our accountability group, we're actually gonna be going over a book right here. It's called Real, and the author is Katherine Parks. And we're gonna go through an eight-week series. It's There's only seven chapters, but it'll be an eight-week series. And we're gonna start on June 15th, and it's gonna be every Monday night from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Uh, so we really just wanna take the time and create a space where um, the women in this ministry can come together, um, just open up, share, and be vulnerable with each other. So um, after you see this announcement, you'll, you're guys, you guys will be receiving um, a link that'll give you the registration form and um, the link to the book that you need for this course. So yeah, we are really excited to see everybody and to study this book together and we hope you can join us. Bye. All right, that's it. We'll see you guys in the Zoom conference uh, that's gonna be taking place in about 15 minutes from now. So please, please, please join us for that. We wanna see your face. We wanna be able to have a conversation about all of these things um, to be able to spend some time together as a body together on Sunday, all right? We'll see you guys soon. Take a break. Uh, but please, please, please make sure you come back for that. The link is now in the chat, all right? We'll see you guys soon. Thanks. Bye.